U.S. Mil what's talked, what's called military industry, is just high-tech industry. I mean, military industry is indistinguishable from general high-tech industry. Uh, it, military, the military is kind of a cover for the state sector of the economy. I mean, like at MIT where I am, uh, everybody knows this except the economists, uh, and everybody else knows it because it pays their salaries. You know, so uh, the money comes into places like MIT under military contracts uh, to produce the next generation of uh, uh, you know, the high-tech economy. You know, you take a look at what's called the new economy. You know, computers, internet, that sort of thing. Yeah, it all comes straight out of places like MIT under federal contracts for research and development uh, under the cover of military production. And then it gets handed over to IBM when you can sell something. Uh, so like, you know, my wife, for example, in the 1950s was uh, a programmer at a uh, uh, military lab at MIT, which Lincoln Laboratories. And it was supposed to be top secret and everything, except everybody knew exactly what was going on. This is all totally open. Uh, and the people flowing up. I was in the electronics lab at MIT and uh, under 100% military contracts also. And every, it was perfectly clear. They were working on what they called an air defense system. So she was programming for an air defense system. It was a total joke. You know? I mean, everybody knew we couldn't defend anyone against a First World War bomber piloted by Snoopy or something like that. <laughs> and besides, nobody cared about bombers anymore because they were going on to intercontinental missiles. You know? But it, what they were actually doing was changing, com was developing computers. I mean, in those days, in the 1950s, a computer would have filled a single computer, this entire building, with the vacuum tubes blowing up all the time and paper going all over the place. And, you know, it's uh, just unwieldy. And by the end of the decade, around 1960, they had succeeded in reducing a computer to a mainframe, like you know, half the size of this room. Uh, at that point, you could start selling them. So the head of the project pulled off and founded the first mainframe uh, f firm, uh, DEC. Uh, meanwhile, IBM had been ripping off the research uh, at uh, MIT and Harvard on government contracts, and they were kind of figuring out how to make smaller computers too. And then they went on through the early 90s developing computers under government contract for either the Pentagon or the National Security Administration and so on. And finally, they got to the point where they could sell them. Uh, and uh, then you, you know, you have computers. Uh, same with the internet. Uh, Thirty years it was in the government system. Uh, it <coughs> started at places like MIT, and the same with everything else. You go across the board. Uh, if you take a look at MIT now, where I am, uh, the around surrounding area used to have small electronics firms. Now it has small biotech firms. Uh, the reason is because the next cutting edge of the economy is going to be biology based. So funding from the government for biology-based research is vastly increasing. And if you want to have a small startup company, they'll make a huge amount of money when somebody buys it someday. Uh, you do it in genetic engineering or biotechnology and so on. And ultimately, it'll make profits for somebody. Uh, and that's military industry. So yes, military industry wants it, but so does industry. Because it's the same thing. You know, they're just one component of it. In fact, there's almost no element of the economy that doesn't work like this. Uh, that's, uh, and that's why, in fact, it, and it goes right through history. You know, that's, yeah, it's usually dynamic state sector that gets economies going. So military industry wants it, uh, and not only for this reason, but, uh, uh, you know, they want, uh, one of the reasons they want to control the oil, they don't want access to the oil. That's a mistake. It's co commonly discussed, but the U.S. doesn't even care about access to the oil. They expect to use Atlantic Basin sources, which are much more reliable, you know, like West Africa and uh, Venezuela and so on. Uh, but they want to control it. And you control it because, it, first of all, the profits flow back. And, uh, and they flow in a lot of ways. I mean, it's not just oil company profits. It's also military sales. So the biggest uh, purchaser of arms, of U.S. arms at least, and uh, probably British. Uh, I mean, you're the, it's either Saudi Arabia or the United Arab Emirates. <coughs> you know, it's one of the rich oil producers. They, they draw most of the arms. And that's uh, profits for high-tech industry in Britain and the United States. 
and uh, they, or just money goes right back to the U.S. Treasury and Treasury securities. And uh, in various ways, this helps prop up the primarily British and U.S. economies. In Britain, it was dramatic. I mean, in Britain, I don't know if you ever looked at the records, but uh, probably have. But in, in 1958, when Iraq broke the Anglo-American condominium on oil production, they pulled out of the system. Uh, Britain went totally crazy. I mean, Selwyn Lloyd, who was then foreign secretary, flew to uh, Washington, and they, these are out in both the British and American records. And uh, they dis you know, discussed uh, what to do to prevent. Uh, see, the British at that time maybe still were very reliant on Kuwaiti uh, profits. <coughs> Uh, the Kuwaiti uh, Investment Corporation was in London, meaning under British control, and Britain was getting, uh, you needed the petrodollars for supporting you know, the British economy. And it looked as if uh, what happened in Iraq might spread to Kuwait. So at that point, Britain and the U.S. decided to uh, grant Kuwait a nominal independence. <coughs> Up till then, it was complete, just a colony. And they said, okay, you can run your own post office and, you know, pretend you have a flag and that sort of thing. Uh, but of course, Britain will run it. And uh, they uh, said, you know, Lloyd said, uh, if anything goes wrong with this, uh, we will ruthlessly intervene to ensure maintaining control. And the U.S. agreed and said, yeah, they do the same thing in Saudi Arabia and, and the Emirates. Uh, and, uh, but that's control, that's not access. I mean, at that time, North America was the biggest uh, producer in the world. You know, they didn't, didn't use it one drop of Saudi oil.